Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is John Norman, I'm Head of Marketing here at Optibrium and moderator for what promises to be a packed presentation today, which is AI-guided design of anti-malarials with in vitro validation. So, now it's time to hand over to our presenters, who today are Ben Irwin, our Senior Scientist from Optibrium, Matt Siegel, our CEO, CEO, who will host today's webinar, and our guest today, Professor Matthew Todd, who is Chair of Drug Discovery at University College London and founder of the Open Source Malaria Initiative. Uh, so Matt, I will now hand things over to you. Many thanks, John, for your introduction. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We can see a great audience out there, lots of familiar and new names, so we hope you'll enjoy today's presentation. First of all, I'm very delighted to welcome uh, Professor Matt Todd to our webinar. As we've heard, Professor, uh, Professor Todd is Chair of Drug Discovery at University College London. His research interests include the development of new ways to make molecules, particularly how to make chiral molecules with new catalysts. He's also interested in making metal complexes that do unusual things when they meet biological molecules or metal ions. His lab motto is to make the right molecule in the right place at the right time, and his students are still currently trying to work out what this means. As we'll hear in a minute, Matt has a significant interest in open science and how it may be used to accelerate research with particular emphasis on open source discovery of new medicines. He founded and currently leads several open science consortia such as the Open Source Malaria Group and is a founder of a broader open source pharma movement. In 2012, OSM Consortium was awarded one of three Wellcome Trust, Google and PLOS Accelerating Science Awards, and for his open source research, Matt was selected for the Medicine Makers Power List in 2017 and 2018. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Matt, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Open Source Malaria Consortium and the particular challenge that we'll be speaking about today. So over to you. Great, thank you so much, Matt, and uh, thanks for the invitation to come along and, uh, and address this webinar. Um, yeah, this um, this whole project has been a really fascinating uh, journey, and I guess my job today is just to give you a little bit of background as to um, the nature of open source malaria and uh, how it works and so on, um, so that people can understand the the way in which things are kind of put together. Uh, so. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what open source means, um, and then a little about what happens when you do science like this, and then very briefly at the end, um, in, a, in a few minutes' time, I'll talk a little bit about about money, about how you know drug discovery can operate without um, without secrecy, which is a, a core part of everything. So just very quickly through the approach of um, open source malaria, um, open source implies something quite specific. So. Uh, we all know about open access to the literature, meaning we can read things, um, and many of us, of course, are familiar with the idea of open data, um, particularly around things like the Human Genome Project and the Hubble Telescope, and uh, more recently, lots of initiatives around new medicines for coronavirus. Um, but open source implies something else, which we're familiar with from things like Wikipedia. Um, open source means that as something is being done, uh, others, uh, anybody, can get involved creatively. So you can um, get involved in doing uh, experiments, get involved in writing. So rather than waiting until the end of a research project, uh, people can get involved as it's happening. Um, and the, the, the approach really is, is governed by these six laws here, um, which were formulated when we tried this approach uh, with the World Health Organization um, well, some time ago now, between like 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, which uh, solved a, a problem they had with the world's uh, most widely used antihelmintic medicine. Um, and uh, and the, the basis of that um, led to these rules about, about the approach of open source, uh, of which the first three are the most important. Um, all data and ideas are open, anyone can take part in there, no patents. The other three rules are just about rules of behavior. And what this means is you have to record um, everything you're doing using online uh, lab notebooks. Uh, which people can see 
so every experiment is, is public domain in real time. Um, you can discuss and debate things and assign tasks uh, for which we use um, a website called GitHub, which many of you be, will be familiar with. Uh, data, of course, is open and, and can be easily shared via things like Google Sheets. Um, and social media allows us to build a community of people um, quite easily and, and, and uh, uh, promulgate problems, needs, and achievements quite easily. And over the years, there have been many cases in which there have been spontaneous inputs from uh, students individually or student groups um, through to fully-fledged um, pharmaceutical professionals who chip in real experiments. So a really wide range of, of inputs have happened um, over the years to, to accelerate the research as this kind of distributed team. Uh, so far, open source malaria, which is a small molecule drug discovery initiative, um, has been taking public domain hits, usually from um, pharmaceutical screens like the GSK uh, Triscantos anti-malarial set, um, and, uh, and also a screen that was done by Pfizer just before they closed the, the sandwich site. Um, and have been progressing those through hit to lead and lead optimization campaigns. Um, the first series there you'll see was, was, uh, was halted because we couldn't get over a couple of problems with that, but we published that series. Uh, second series was uh, paused because we knew that we were duplicating um, uh, activities from a, from a closed group of researchers. Uh, and series three and series four are currently active. Um, uh, series three displays very nice properties and, and has a potentially novel me mechanism of action. And series four is uh, the, the series that's the subject of today's presentation. Um, in vivo active molecules uh, with a, an interesting mechanism of action. Um, which we wanted to probe, uh, which, was the, which is what I'll talk about uh, now. So just as an example of how this works, this open source mechanism, here are three molecules that we needed for the first series that we, uh, that we were looking at, and we couldn't get them uh, made um, locally. So we put out this sort of wanted poster, and um, a guy called Patrick Thompson, who was finishing his PhD in Scotland, said, I can make one of those, um, and began to work independently of us. Um, we were at the time in Sydney. Um, and uh, began posting the, the raw data to a, to a public place, and, and, and so we could see the quality of the work. Uh, we're summarizing what he was doing on, on Twitter, so we could sort of keep in touch. Um, ended up making several molecules uh, for the paper, which were really useful additions to the SAR, um, and he became an author on the paper. So this kind of completely federated, independent way of working uh, as part of an open group uh, is, is, a, is a good example of, of what have been many contributions like this over the years. Um, you can easily publish things like this, of course, now. Um, back in the day, it was not easy to publish uh, work that was completely public domain because journals didn't, didn't used to like that kind of thing. But now we're in the era of the preprint, and, and we were able to publish this paper um, in ACS Central Science when it, when it first started. Even though all the data points are in the public domain already, it doesn't matter. Um, you can still uh, publish the paper as a final piece of work with a lot of supporting information. Um, now, the, the nature of the, the, the challenge today, uh, which we'll talk about today, w was this, that the, the suspected target of our fourth series was this um, very large membrane-bound iron pump called PFATP4. Uh, that is the uh, suspected target of the, the big new hope in antimalarial chemotherapy, which is on the top line, that second molecule, the spiroindolone from Novartis. Uh, which is currently in phase three, as I understand the clinical trials. Um, several other molecules apparently also hit this target, for which there is no crystal structure, um, but it's possible to measure ion gradients just outside the uh, the parasite, and and indicate that, that which indicates that this is the this is the target, um, an ion pump which regulates uh, sodium ions and, and protons. Um, and it seems as though uh, all of these different chemotypes on this slide do the same thing, including our own series four. Uh, we were very surprised by this, um, just because the diversity of structures which seemed to be, have the same phenotype was, was bewildering. Um, so we were interested in working out how this is. Um, no crystal structure has been forthcoming. Uh, there's a homology model, but it's a fairly distant homology model. Um, and so we were trying to figure out, well, how does this work? Do really all these things hit the same place? Um, how, if we don't have the target, can we be more predictive in what we make next? Um, we were still at a point in the project where we were making uh, you know, new analogs uh, for the project, um, which could take a couple of weeks to make of postdoc time. You know, it's like a thousand, two thousand dollars, um, and we were still getting uh, surprising inactives. So the expense was really starting to ramp up as we went into lead optimization, and we really wanted to try to be a bit more predictive. Um, so uh, uh, several years ago, we we had a go at, at making a a, a, um, a pharmacophore model for what was going on here, which wasn't uh, which wasn't terribly predictive. And, uh, and we had a, a first round of an open competition in open source malaria um, about three or four years ago, 
where uh, we ask the community to suggest models for, uh, for, for uh, predictive models for, for, for something we could use in the project. Um, using all of the active data and the inactive compounds and you know we had a, a public data set and basically said to the community well have at it see what you can do with this um, and then that, that led to some models which are reasonably predictive and uh, winners of the competition and so on so it, it was a good um, outcome but um, in recent years as everyone here will know um, there have been massive changes in, in the extent to which companies have been involved in uh, AI and machine learning and we we wanted to run this competition again which we did at the end of last year, uh, finishing up at the beginning of this year, again with more data now and, uh, and trying to encourage the participation of companies in an open project. So where everyone's sharing the data and where if you enter the competition, you have to post your results on the website so that everyone else can see them um, as they develop their own models. So it really is you know, extremely open competition uh, where you're allowed to see other people's entries. And the end result of that was, um, was, was several entries um, from the public and private sectors which was interesting. Um, the private sector obviously able to enter the competition uh, without giving up any of that secret source. Right? So you can, you can develop a model and put it in the public domain with the results and have it validated against some data which we kept back. So several people um, will be well mentioned here and I'm sure that in this community you, you, you know each other. Um, it, was a, it was a really good result with, with good results from public and private sectors with, with prizes awarded to, to the, uh, the leading entrance. And then crucially what we wanted to do was ask the best models, the best performing models, to derive uh, new molecules. So to do the generative models, which would allow us to predict new structures, which, um, which we could make and test, which is, which is what we then uh, did. Um, and I think the results of some of that will be coming in, uh, in, a, in a later slide in the, in the presentation. Um, to write this up, we're, we're doing that openly as well. So there's a, the paper is being con constructed currently at this website. Uh, we've just recently taken off that website because we're, we're putting it into a journal submission format and tidying it up ready for submission. But again, the, uh, the paper writing was done um, collaboratively in public too. So um, the, the results of what happened there will be discussed in a minute. Um, here are some of the other uh, open projects that we've been involved with with, with the same basic idea um, of trying to do uh, hit to lead projects uh, in public with contributions from, from anybody. Um, Many of these, of course, are against tropical or neglected diseases where um, it's a little bit easier to understand some of the economics. Um, really, the idea behind this, to take a step back to the big picture, is just to, to try to think of an alternative model for uh, drug discovery and development, uh, an alternative to the current you know, standard pharmaceutical model. Um, this is not an attempt to replace the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the pharma industry are, are some of the biggest contributors to open source projects in terms of the, uh, the science and, and research. Um, but the idea is to try and generate an alternative which may be able to uh, deliver in areas where the traditional model um, can, can sometimes uh, fail to do so. Um, development of new antibiotics perhaps, and uh, neglect tropical diseases, areas of great risk like uh, dementia, um, and, uh, and so on. Um, and, and one of the ways we're, we're trying to explore doing that is, is how one might develop a medicine in the open without any uh, patent protection. Um, and yet still perhaps develop a sustainable way of doing that, uh, perhaps through you know, reimbursement of, of the people who contributed um, or, or some other model of, of, of doing that. And, and one, one possibility which is being explored right now is, is making use of, of data and market exclusivities which already exist um, as, as ways perhaps of giving that protection to a medicine that is being sold on the market without the need for patent protection. As many of you will know, uh, patent protection and, and, and data exclusivity arrangements are, are separate, uh, mutually mutual ways of, of protecting a medicine so that um, it, can be, it can be sold with some protection from competition. Um, and, and so this has been discussed recently. Uh, if you're interested in this idea, um, there's a nice paper uh, reference at the bottom there, which describes a, a, an experiment by um, uh, Al Edwards of the Structural Genomics Consortium who started a, a, a small virtual pharma company called M4K Pharma, which is making use of uh, data exclusivities as a method of, uh, of protection in order to stimulate uh, an open source drug discovery program. Um, and we're trying to do the same thing now um, with a company. We, we just started called M4ID Pharma. Um, those of you who are interested, uh, please go along and, and have a look at the, uh, the rationale there about uh, how this might work for the development of medicines um, in the open. I mentioned this only uh, from the point of view of trying to understand how open source research could in fact one day lead to the translation um, into a new medicine that will benefit uh, patients. 
Um, just to thank a few people for, for this part of the, um, the presentation. So um, Ed Sir there, the uh, second photo along, was uh, the student who really drove a lot of the, uh, the chemistry that we did to, to validate some of these models. Um, and, uh, and the funding for, for this project uh, came from the, the second logo there, um, the AI3SD Discovery Network, an EPSSC funded network run by uh, Jeremy Frey at Southampton. Um, thanks also in particular, there's lots of people involved in this project, but thanks also in particular to uh, Chris Swain of, uh, of Cambridge Mechan Consulting, who, who, who did a lot of um, support work for, for the project as we've been going along. Um, so thanks to all of them, and um, I guess uh, the, the uh, denouement of this whole thing will come when you see some of the structures that were predicted um, and how they performed. But um, that's all for me in terms of a, of a background to open source malaria. Many thanks for a, a lovely overview of the Open Source Malaria Project and uh, the, the challenge that, that was posed in the context of this project. Uh, we've certainly uh, really enjoyed working with your team and, and the many other collaborators on this project. Now, before I hand over to Ben, who's going to tell us about the uh, majority of, of the results today, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes telling you about the, the primary method that we'll be speaking about. Um, and that is the so-called Alchemite method for uh, deep learning imputation. Um, this is a collaboration with our colleagues at Intelligence, um, and we've been working with them now for a couple of years applying this method uh, to challenges in drug discovery. Um, so just to give you a very quick summary, because we've spoken at great length about this method in other webinars and in various papers, uh, but what's really unique uh, about the Alchemite method is, first of all, it's a method for imputation. What that means is it can take as input sparse experimental data, sort of illustrated here by the, the green squares, directly as input and essentially fill in the blanks, these sort of purple squares on the right-hand side. However, it can also take molecular descriptors, these sort of orange squares here for all of the compounds. Now, these are complete because you can calculate every descriptor for every compound. And what this means is that it can learn directly from the relationship between different experimental endpoints as well as the conventional structure activity relationships between descriptors and assays. What this means is it can make better use of, of sparse and, and noisy experimental data, as we usually have in drug discovery, than a conventional QSAR model. As I say, it sort of fills in the gaps in the existing experimental data. But what we've also been able to demonstrate is that it can make predictions for virtual compounds, so based purely on structural descriptors, as Ben will show you later on, it can also generate predictions uh, with a high degree of accuracy. The other very nice thing about Alchemite is that it doesn't just generate a single value for every prediction, but it actually generates a probability distribution. And so it can estimate the uncertainty in each individual prediction. So sometimes you see predictions like this on the right-hand side with a very broad, wide probability distribution. And that's the model saying, look, I'm not really sure what this value is. It's somewhere around here, but it's got a very big error bar. Where on the left-hand side, we can see an example of a very sharply peaked probability distribution. This means the model is very confident about the value it's predicting. It's got small error bars. And this helps us, as you'll see later on, to confidently target high-quality compounds and prioritize the experimental resources that we have at our disposal. Now, as I mentioned, there are many other sources of information about this, um, particularly uh, a paper that we published just over a year ago in Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling, uh, a second paper that appeared just earlier this year in Future Drug Discovery, uh, which really discusses specifically the difference between imputation and prediction, um, and hot off the press, in fact, just appeared on the Journal of Chemical Information and Modeling website, um, is our latest uh, paper on the practical applications of deep learning uh, in the context of drug discovery projects. Uh, Preprints or reprints of all of these are available on our community site, as John mentioned earlier. And if you want to hear any of our previous webinars, you can also find those uh, on, on the community website. So without further ado, I'm now going to introduce uh, Ben. So Ben is a senior scientist here at Optibrium. Uh, he has a PhD in theoretical physics from Cambridge University. And at Optibrium, he's responsible for developing and applying cutting-edge machine learning algorithms, such as Alchemite, to drug discovery. So Ben's been leading the team here at Optibrium who's been working on the OSM project and has generated the results that he's now going to share with us today. 
So over to you, Ben, uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much, Matt, and thank you very much, Matt, for the uh, introduction there. So I'm going to talk about applying Alchemite to the, uh, the project here. And to start with, let's drill right down to that open source data that Matt Todd was talking about. Um, I've taken some example slices of the actual OSM data here. Um, now, in this spreadsheet, rows represent compounds and columns represent different assays, which have been done in all of those different um, uh, dispersed labs around the world, different series of compounds. And that naturally, uh, as you can see, generates a very sparse looking matrix. Um, so you've got different uh, assays here. There's, there's this G GSK lab, uh, Sinjin lab, Dundee lab, and you've also got different strains of the malaria parasite, the uh, K1 here, 3D7, DD2. So all of this data, although it's quite similar measurements for the same target, um, it's, it's got different qualities to it, different ranges, uh, different sensitivities. The inactives of this data have different ranges um, here, and there's, there's, there's various uh, other points about the data. So the main thing was in the original sheet, there's this big column that's uh, averaged over all of those different assays. Um, and we're going to avoid that because uh, we've got Alchemite, and Alchemite handles um, this, this sparse data naturally. So we don't need to aggregate the columns um, to do modeling as some of the other groups did. Um, so instead, we can delete that average column and work with the data in its natural form. Each column is a different lab or a different strain or a different assay. Um, and we're going to impute, as Matt showed, all of the values in that, uh, in that table. Um, and we get a uh, distribution or an error bar for all of those predictions as well. So uh, just to show there's different ranges on that data, uh, there's this table here on the right. Um, and you'll see that they're all uh, either PEC50s or PIC50s, and that's because we've transformed the original data into these log units, because that's a natural way to work. There are two additional columns, this single shot inhibition, which is percentage, and an iron regulation activity measure. Um, and then we worked around the qualified data, those, those inactive type results, um, by duplicating and adding a bit of, of noise around them, uh, removing the qualifier. So when generating these Alchemite models, we need to generate descriptors, as Matt showed that solid block um, where we can calculate these for each of the compounds in the data set. And we use the Stardrop uh, Automodeler descriptors. So these are 330 substructural fragments and whole molecule properties, including molecular weight, uh, lithophilicity, uh, surface area, and volume. Um, and then after we've got that, we took all of the data uh, available in the open source format and performed a stratified 80-20 split into two data sets. So we've got a training set with 80% of the values and a validation set with 20% of the values. Uh, when we make the Alchemite models for this, we used a default set of hyperparameters and this allowed uh, 50 of either the descriptor columns or the sparse assay uh, columns to be used as inputs to generate a model for each output column in that set. So each assay or each lab or each strain type result. Um, and we could maybe have improved this by doing uh, five-fold cross-validation and hyperparameter optimization. But for the scope of this project, we just did the uh, generic set of hyperparameters. So now we can look at the performance of the Alchemite models on each of those separate columns on the validation set for the imputation model where we're filling in the gaps in the data. Um, we can measure that in terms of two performance metrics. One is the coefficient of determination, or R squared, which is shown in the top graph. And for this, the higher value means a better model. Um, not to be confused with the Pearson correlation coefficient, um, the R squared coefficient of determination is in the range minus infinity to one, and zero represents a random result. Uh, we've also got the root mean squared error, uh, and for this metric, lower is better, and that's shown in the table below. So these two tables show us, um, the graphs there show us that half of the models are very good. 
um, the right hand side of the top figure um, the training uh, performance of the model and the validation performance of the model are very similar and they're all quite high R squareds there, some of them very high. So these are excellent models. The models on the left uh, are not so good, but because Alchemite's modeling each column separately, we can see that and we can choose to use uh, models as appropriate, right? So models which mix the data together from many different sources, for example, may be at a disadvantage we can see the Kemble-based data, the Kemble source data, uh, occurs near the far left of both of these plots here. And that shows that uh, maybe this, this data is a lot more confused from different sources. The model is finding it hard to build a, uh, a robust model of that, whereas these other data sources are, are much more trustworthy. We didn't know at the time, but uh, future tests would be made in the Dundee lab or uh, assay. So we can see here on this plot, uh, that's this model in the middle. It's not the worst, it's not the best. When predicting all of the data points, we come up with a headline R squared value of just over 0.3. However, this is where Alchemite's ability to work with uncertainties becomes uh, really crucial. You see, um, Alchemite, as Matt described, performs a probability distribution for each of the predicted cells in that sheet. So we can um, look here at the predicted values on this plot on the left. Each one gets an error bar, the Alchemite error bar, for that prediction. Uh, and we can plot them in a scatter against their observed values for the validation set. So some of these points have very small error bars and some have very large error bars. And we can actually focus in on the most confident predictions and see if that makes a more accurate model. That's the plot on the right here. And this measures essentially focusing in on the most confident predictions along the y axis, uh, the x axis, and we're checking whether that increases the accuracy here in terms of root mean squared error decreasing. Uh, the yellow uh, or orange curve here for Alchemite does indeed decrease rapidly as you focus in on those uh, data points with the smallest error bars, you get a much better RMSE than a random removal of, of data points. So this is a significant um, effect and Alchemite can focus in on those points. Um, to put that in, in, in a, a more obvious way, we can pick a cutoff at say 50%, uh, the 50% of the data which are most uh, confident, and plot them here in those orange points on the left curve. And we do see that those are very tightly clustered around the identity line there, the dashed black line. So it is working. We can focus in on the, uh, the most accurate data. Uh, for this particular assay, we've lost some of the range there, but it is more accurate here. For other assays, for example, the Syngene assay was very good um, in the models there. We get exactly the same effect here. And when we focus in on the most confident 50% of the data, uh, there's a much wider range for this model. Uh, and all of those points are nicely clustered around the identity line. So it's this effect with the uncertainties that is very powerful. So what can we do with that? Straight off, um, we've got this data set. We filled in the cells with missing values. And now we can, uh, to some extent, mine that data set, the original open source data there, and look for interesting or unlikely um, outcomes. Because Alchemite has this probability distribution for each prediction, it can tell you whether an existing experimental result is uh, likely or unlikely given the rest of the data that it's seen. Um, so there's a, a brief example of that is um, one compound in the data set had a single experimental inactive result a greater than 10 uh, IC50 written in the Dundee column. And uh, by the Alchemite imputation model, it was actually predicted to be very active in, in two other assays with a high degree of confidence. So it had a predicted PEC50 of 7.2 in one assay and a predicted single shot inhibition of 96% with a small error bar. Uh, the explanation is that that compound is shown here on the right. It's a chiral compound, and the, the original measurement, which was logged in the data sheet, was uh, measured to be inactive. But upon further investigation, it turns out that the, that was one of the enantiomers, and there was another enantiomer that's active as predicted. So, this is an example of, of Alchemite highlighting a missed opportunity in the original uh, training data, as it were, that would otherwise uh, have, have gone unnoticed, but it's the error bars that, that highlighted that. 
So the next thing to do um, is to take the uh, held out um, test set that Matt Todd mentioned at the introduction to test the models that were going into this competition. Now, there's two different um, ways of building a model, and it's important to just quickly go through this. Um, when we build the imputation model, we have some existing experimental data shown here in green. We can build the model with descriptors and data, and we can test against some held out data points based on the imputed values. But for a held out test set with no experimental data, we can build that virtual model that Matt described. Um, and in this case, we build the original model as before with the experimental data we've already measured in the sparse format. But when we come to make predictions, there will be no experimental inputs into that model. It's more like a QSAR model at this stage or a virtual model. And it's going to fill in the whole matrix um, with, with values. And we're going to compare those against this held out test set, which is provided by OSM for this um, competition. So the results of that uh, first stage, we retrained um, the model on all of the data, and we tested it using that virtual type model on the OSM data. The results are assessed by OSM, and those are available on the, uh, the GitHub for everyone to see. Um, but essentially, um, they converted the, all of the models into a classification type um, analogy with a one micromolar active cutoff. Um, so if it was less than one micromolar, it's active, and above it's inactive. And our model was one of the top-ranked models in that competition with 25 correct predictions. Um, there were six false positives and two false negatives. However, if you look into more detail, the six post false positives all had very large error bars. So Alchemite was actually aware that it, it was less confident in those false positive results. So that was encouraging to see. Um, not all uh, analysis metrics take the quality of the error model into account. So the conclusions from this first uh, section were that we can work with sparse data really easily using this uh, imputation type methods. There was no need to aggregate the data into one column across all those different uh, assays. And we could identify the most reliable endpoints to trust, the most reliable models to trust. And then for a given uh, column or model, the Alchemite uncertainty estimates were, were quite robust, allowing us to focus in on accurate predictions directly. So it leads to this effective increase in model performances and more confident predictions. We can build a virtual model uh, to predict the future, compound ideas that haven't been made and don't have experimental data associated with them. And this performed very well on the blind test set. Um, and we were chosen to proceed to uh, an exciting second round of the competition where those uh, models that did the best would then be used to propose and generate new active compounds within the series four ongoing series that Matt Top described at the beginning. Um, now, there is a, a caveat there that not every uh, model that is good can necessarily generate good ideas. It, it might only be able to judge them. But I'll briefly hand over to Matt, who will go through the, uh, the generative method we use for this part of the work. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ben. So I'm just going to have a, a brief interlude here, really just to talk about generation and prioritization of compound ideas. And to do this, we used our Stardrop software. So as Ben mentioned, uh, the goal of this project was to generate some new ideas around a specific series of interests, series four, as it's described. Um, and so the approach that we took is in what we call our, our Nova module. And the reason that we take this approach is to really take a, an initial starting point and apply what we call MedChem transformation rules. These are commonly applied transformations from sort of medicinal chemistry experience because if we're going to generate new compounds, they need to make sense from a MedChem perspective and in the context uh, of this specific series. So these transformations aren't just sort of simple substitutions, but can also include framework transformations uh, and, and sort of larger structural changes. In this particular case, we were quite restrained because we did need to stay within the scope of, of this specific series. And essentially, this is an evolutionary algorithm. You start with one or more initial compounds, what you might describe as sort of a seed, 
and we apply transformations that expand around this. And we can do this in multiple generations, so apply one set of transformations, uh, take the best molecules in a sort of evolutionary sense from this to generate a second set, um, and then from that we can go third and we can get further and further away from that starting point. And each generation, this selection bias is applied based not only in terms of the quality or prioritization of the compounds, but also uh, we can bias this towards an exploration of diversity so that we're not just going down one very narrow search route. Of course, during this process, we need to think about how we choose which molecules in each generation, how we prioritize those that come out uh, of this process. And to do that, really, we want to use this concept of, of multi-parameter optimization. So we know that a successful compound must have a balance of, of many different properties. Obviously, potency against our target, but also appropriate physical chemical, add me and safety properties. Our goal is to start with our initial molecule and move as quickly as possible to this sort of sweet spot where we're most likely to find that high quality lead, you know, candidate, and of course, hopefully, ultimately, a drug. In this case, we were particularly focused on the balance of activities in these different assays rather than lots of different ADME properties, but you'll see that the same principle applies. And the way that we achieved this was using what we call probabilistic scoring. Um, this is uh, within our Stardrop software, as I mentioned. What this enables you to do is to define a profile of properties that are required in a successful compound for a specific objective. Here's a, a fairly generic sort of objective for an active compound with appropriate physical, chemical, and ADME properties, in this case for a, a CNS target and, and an orally dosed compound. But it enables you to define the different endpoints you're interested in, the criteria that you're looking to achieve for each of those, and also the importance of each individual objective to the overall success of a compound. And what's really unique about this is having defined that, it brings together all of the data that you have, and it accounts for all of that uncertainty information, the error bars around each of the individual data points. So it gives an objective assessment of, of the compound's chance of success, essentially by ranking them in terms of their likelihood of success, the, the probability of achieving the ideal outcome that we've defined. And for each of the individual compounds, you can also get this sort of readout of the contribution of each individual property or endpoint that you're interested in. These little histograms show you where the sort of critical issues, in this case, you can see the, the light blue and the pink bar corresponds to the, the log P and the Herg inhibition uh, in this particular profile. So with that little bit of background uh, about some of the methods that we'll be applying, I'm going to hand over back to Ben, who's going to tell us about how we apply these principles in the context of this specific project. Thanks, Matt. So we've got a schematic here that shows um, the generation procedure for the, uh, the ideas we generated for the second round of the, the OSM uh, competition there. And we can see elements of this. Um, so we've got alchemite, which we've talked about already. Nova, which which uh, the generative method that, that Matt just introduced, and also the multi-parameter optimization that Matt just went through there. But we start in the top left-hand corner of this uh, schematic with this raw data and the structures, and those flow through to data preparation. We've built our alchemite model, both the imputation model and the virtual prediction model, and we showed they could confidently identify missed opportunities. But at this stage, NOVA was used to generate um, lots of ideas for compounds. So those can all go into the, uh, the Alchemite model for virtual predictions. We can generate lots and lots of ideas, um, get uh, Alchemite predictions with error bars for those, and the predictions and the error bars all go into a multi-parameter optimization routine. And then this will lead to the best few compounds, those most likely to succeed, and in theory, this feedback loop can be applied where those can be um, looked at by an experienced or expert chemist. Uh, there might be experimental verification, and those will flow back into the initial data or uh, potentially update the, uh, the design parameters of either NOVA or the score profile used in that multi-parameter uh, scoring. 
In terms of the score profile for this um, actual uh, event, we, we wanted, as Matt said, to balance these different columns, the different models, um, to try and search for compounds with a good activity profile. But there was also an additional requirement of uh, increasing the solubility, because I, I think they found that uh, the, the most active compounds for this target weren't very soluble. So we can draw up a score profile on the right that takes all of this into account. And uh, in terms of activity, we can set a target such as PIC50 greater than 6. That represents that active cutoff of uh, one micromolar. And the key thing is that all those alchemite uncertainties are also going to propagate through into this score. And it will give us a, a probability of success for each compound we generate. So we've put the, uh, the Dundee assay and the Syngene assay, those two that I showed you earlier, and we've put a very high importance for those assays. Um, then we've got these other good models here. These had strong alchemite models, and we can set high importance. You've got maybe slightly less relevant different strains, and you can bring the importance down again. And then you've got those models which weren't so good uh, on the overall testing metrics, and we can turn the importance right down for those. So this represents a nice balance between all of the different um, inputs um, to the score profile. To show you that in action, uh, here's the score profile loaded up in Stardrop, and then we've got the OSM compounds loaded in here, uh, and these would be the alchemite predictions in these columns. Um, so then we generate the score for each of these compounds, uh, and that appears in this column along with its histogram, and we can rank those based on the, pro uh, based on the probability to succeed um, and look at the top few compounds uh, and specifically focus in on those ones. So we took NOVA and essentially we've generated about a million new compounds once you go through all of those generations and generations, um, uh, the genetic process there, and we can rank those uh, compounds. We use the most promising structures um, ranked as starting seeds for that process, and then we filtered off the most promising structures from the virtual uh, alchemite model. And this led to these two on the left, which were very promising. We could see this, uh, the histogram there is, is quite high in all of the different elements um, and quite flat there. Um, and there's a table with breakdown for the, the, the individual assay values of those. And we can see that a lot of the assays have PIC50s PIC greater than six, which is what we were after. And these were some of the most confident uh, suggestions of that as well. The compound on the top um, we rejected because we, we looked at it and said we think it's quite unstable um, here, and instead we favored this, this tert-butyl derivative type molecule here, uh, and that was the one that we proposed to OSM to go and be tested in an assay and, and uh, get back the actual assay result. And we were very excited because uh, uh, there were four different groups. Um, competing here, and uh, this led to five different compounds being submitted to OSM in this way and synthesized, um, and our compound had the, the, uh, the best activity there. We were really pleased with this result because um, it was considered to be active based on that cutoff, um, and we, we believe it's because of these, uh, these error bars we're taking into account here, right? We're looking at the most confident results, and we're focusing on those, taking those uncertainties into account. And uh, the predicted PIC50 for the Dundee assay was uh, 6.4. The actual measured PIC50 is 6.2, is well within the, uh, the error bar around that point. Um, and we think this, this group, this substitution here, is actually uh, somewhat unusual. It wouldn't have been considered in the, the SAR, so, so it's opened up this new uh, direction there for the the uh, malaria um, open malaria uh, competition. I'll hand back to Matt now. Um, it's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Ben. That that's absolutely great. Um, so just to go back one slide for a second uh, before we sort of move on to the Q and A session, um, I just thought it might be great to hand back to, uh, to Professor Todd. Uh, just to get your impressions of the results that we've just heard. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very interesting one because that that compound that's on the screen there, the uh, the terbutyl derivative, um, it is it is something which I'm I'm fairly sure uh, none of the human participants, none of the humans involved in the SAR over the years would have bothered making because there would be the assumption it would not be active. Um, yeah, we, we played a lot with that northeast part of the molecule, um, and and that would not have been something we were going to we were going to go for. Um, some of the other predictions are, are kind of uh, the other way in the sense that um, ask a human about that uh, that compound in the middle there, the, the third one, um, and I think uh, you know I think the human participants would have said, hey, you know that's that's looking pretty good, and you know we should definitely try that because that that brings in some elements that are familiar from from the, the, the human sense of, of what the SCR is trying to tell you. Um, and and so, so I think what, one of the nice things about this really is that kind of challenge to, to human, I don't know, biases or gut feelings about the molecules, which, uh, which are so valuable. Um, th there's also this sense, of course, that uh, everything is constrained, slightly frustratingly for, for a chemist involved in the project, everything is constrained by um, resources and reality. So there are some really interesting suggestions that were coming up uh, from, from you guys and from others, which it would have been wonderful if we could just, we could have just generated with, with the means we had at the time. Uh, you know, if we were able to be perfect synthetic chemists and place atoms where we want them and make these molecules quickly, it would have been wonderful to see some of the results from those. But we are obviously constrained. So many of these molecules bear some resemblance to um, you know the, the the set that was used as the as the training set, obviously, um, but but nevertheless, you know this one was was a really interesting hit for us, and 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 yeah, it gives us a different sense of of uh, of how this molecule may be interacting with the target. So it was a very satisfying uh, endpoint. Thanks. It's great to get your feedback. Much appreciated. So uh, now we have the opportunity to answer some questions from the audience. Um, and I can see some are, are already coming in, so thank you everyone who has uh, already entered a question. Um, just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to just type it into the question box here on the GoToWebinar control panel, um, and we'll be able to actually see those on our control panel, and we'll go through as, as many as we can in the time available. But just while you have a moment to add a few more questions to the list, uh, I thought I would just let you know a little bit about how you can access uh, Alchemite in, in different ways. Um, so Alchemite is available as part of our augmented chemistry platform at Optibrium. Uh, as you've seen, this blend between the computer's ability to generate ideas, to build models, to uh, help to guide the optimization of compounds, but also, in the example that Ben showed you, that synergy with the expert's ability to uh, provide that feedback and, and gain the most value uh, from, from those results. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that we're working. Um, the first is through a set of collaborations. We're very happy to collaborate with a wide range of different organizations on, on applying Alchemite to ongoing drug discovery projects and specific challenges in drug discovery. You've seen just an example of that here. So whether it be to fill in the gaps in your database with confident results and help you to find those high quality compounds, identifying the most important data to generate and prioritize your experimental resources, run virtual screens uh, to find new starting points and optimization strategies as we've just seen. So if that's of interest, please do get in touch with us at Optibrium. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss your project, your data, and your objectives and provide you with a proposal. And the other thing, just to give you a little uh, glimpse ahead into the future, this is something that is rapidly going through the development process and we expect to be out towards the end of this year is a platform we're calling Sorella, um, and this will work with your data to build and update models using Alchemite. So it can connect directly with your data sources, your data mart, your ELN, whatever way you store your data, to populate this sparse matrix as we've seen. Uh, it apply the sort of transformations that Ben spoke about, any sort of cleaning and business rules, and then use Alchemite to build and, of course, update models as new data become available, whether it be for imputation, so filling in the blanks, or virtual models, as you've just seen, for predicting new compounds that have not yet been synthesized and tested. Of course, if you fill in this matrix, um, you know, in a typical pharma company, this matrix might be 1% complete, 
So if you fill in the matrix, um, you suddenly have maybe 100 times as much data. So we have to manage this very large amount, what we call the massive matrix of results, and then provide seamless access to this, the results in that matrix, and the virtual models, whether it be through our Stardrop software, as you've just seen an example linked with our NOVA module and probabilistic scoring, but also via sort of industry standard RESTful APIs to whatever platform you use to process your compounds and data uh, and use those results in a similar sort of way. Okay, having given you that sort of little bit of extra information, what I'm going to do now is switch over to the question panel here. Um, and I can see already we have lots and lots of questions that have come in. Uh, so let's have a look and see. Um, so the, the first of these, um, if you don't mind, uh, Professor Todd, uh, probably best directed it to you, is, um, is there an annotated file with, with compound activities in different stages and or the target or mechanism of action identified? Uh, the, it's interesting, uh, during the course of the competition, um, some of the participants uh, did improve the data set, which uh, it, it's a, it is, as you saw uh, from Ben's presentation, a little bit rough and ready, that, that spreadsheet. Um, so some of the participants in the course of doing that, uh, uh, working on their entries, did generate a slightly improved version of the data set that could be used by others. So the, the participants improved the competition, um, which was helpful. There's no um, annotated data set for activity against different stages. Um, some of the molecules have been evaluated against the gametostite stage, if, if that's what's uh, being referred to. But, but no, um, this is a phenotypic assay, and, and most of the analysis is done on the blood stage of the parasite. Um, the mechanism of action is, um, is uh, I mean, it, it's likely to be PFATP4, um, but there is no um, confirmed, you know, crystal structure of this protein with these molecules bound uh, still. So uh, there is evidence to suggest that, it, that, that this is the target. Um, and there's evidence to suggest that all the molecules that have the same phenotype do the same thing. So, for example, you can breed um, parasites resistant to one of these drugs that I mentioned, which has this supposed mechanism of action, and you find that it's uh, resistant or tolerant a little bit to some of the others. Um, so I think they share something, but exactly how the molecules are interacting with the target is not known. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so one... Next question is a little bit more of a, a methodological question, so, so maybe Ben, you could help with this. Um, and that is, are the errors of the predicted values always normally distributed? Um, that's a good question. Um, a lot of them are, that's, that's what we know. Um, and even if you, uh, if you boil it down to a mean and a variance um, for a lot of these kind of endpoints, essentially what you're doing is assuming a normal distribution anyway, because it's the maximum entropy distribution on, on that space. Um, but yeah, you can get a, a few weird ones, I think. Um, uh, we haven't done a, 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 a proper study into that, have we? Um, Sorry if that doesn't answer. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the point is that, yes, in most cases, they are approximately normally distributed, but, uh, but certainly it's not assuming any particular form for, a, say, a posterior, so it doesn't have to be. Um, it is a sort of a genuine sort of uh, histogram, if you like, based on an ensemble of models, and, and in some cases you do see, for example, even multimodal distributions where you might be having sort of maybe two different assay conditions that have been mixed or, or something like that. So. Uh, it's a true probability distribution. Um, the other, another one related to error bars. So let's let, let's stick on that topic for a minute. Um, again, Ben, um, uh, you mentioned the error bars on the uh, false positives were all uh, very large um, in the blind test set. Um, can you say anything about the error bars on the, the true positive results? Um, there were two true positive results, so I felt it was best not to extrapolate too much into that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think, yeah, in that case, the error model, well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't um, very large as well. So, you know, they weren't significantly large. So um, it, it's, it may have gone into a different mode where it can sort of really easily detect false um, 
positives but but not the false negatives um but yeah you'd need a much bigger study for for that analysis i think great thank you very much um so here's a question about the uh multi-parameter optimization method uh mentioned in terms of probabilistic scoring um, and this is a more general question, really, about how one goes about selecting properties for a scoring profile and ranking their importance. Um, and so the starting point, really, uh, is often the experience of the, the scientist working on a discovery project, uh, very uh, often based on you know, experience of medicinal chemists or DMPK scientists, pharmacologists, and so on. Uh, one can define the requirements uh, that uh, based on that experience, uh, based on sort of uh, downstream successes uh, for an early stage molecule. Um, and the importance is often uh, a bit subjective um, and one thing that one often discusses in the context of a project team. So very often these are just defined in a somewhat subjective way. However, there is a uh, uh, more so rigorous and statistically rigorous approach for doing that. Uh, for example, in, in Startup, we have a module called MPO Explorer. And what this does is uses existing compounds with downstream data um, and their early results and, and helps to find those rules and to find the criteria for the most important properties and rank them in terms of their importance to the decision being made, to that dis distinction between successful and unsuccessful molecules downstream. So. Um, the second part of the question is, is there a description of this in a paper? Yes, uh, there are, are many papers on our online community that describe multi-parameter optimization um, and also give some examples of profiles and their rationale. And finally, talk more in details about these algorithms for determining the importance uh, of particular criteria and particular properties and also assessing the robustness of the decisions you're making to those chosen criteria and important something we call sensitivity analysis. Um, I, apologies, I won't bring up all of the different references, but if you go onto our online community at octibrium.com slash community, go to publications and presentations and click on multi-parameter optimization, uh, I'm afraid there are many, many hours of reading if you want to drill down into the details. Right, the next one on the, the list, and um, this is a uh, another very good question, which is, um, did we uh, further profile the compound in terms of the solubility, stability, or even pK? So uh, perhaps, uh, Professor Todd, if you wouldn't mind just saying a, a few words about um, you know, it, whether that's progressed any further yet or, or, or how that, that project has moved forward. Yeah, no, so the, the compounds that were made, no, we didn't um, yet measure anything else, um, which is a really interesting question. Um, it would be fun to do that, actually. Um, we were able to get these results done, and then lockdown did begin to interfere a little bit. Um, and so some of the labs that were going to be able to do some of that work couldn't do it, and we ourselves had to leave the lab pretty soon after the last results were obtained. Um, so certainly potency was the, was the primary criterion. Secondary criterion was, was solubility, and it, it might be interesting to, to do that. I guess, um, I, I, I don't know if I'm right here, but there, there seemed to be... Um, Quite, quite a lot of um, advancements in solubility prediction. Um, so I, I guess we're, we may be on, on sort of better ground there than we were on potency prediction, which was a much tougher nut to crack here. Um, so certainly I think we went after the prize, um, but these other considerations will be really interesting to look at for sure. Yes, the, the, the dreaded lockdown unfortunately gets in the way of many, many good endeavors at the moment. So hopefully that will, will lift soon. <laughs> Right, I'm very aware that we're we're sort of uh, run out of time, so uh, I might just uh, just go with with one or two uh, more questions. Uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, but uh, here's one: uh, When new compounds are proposed by the model, are there any rationale or hypothesis that could be understood by a human? So I might uh, take that initially. So one of the advantages of the approach that we took for idea generation. Uh, this transformation-based approach is that it is based upon MedChem experience. So uh, many of the transformations are, are relatively small and very widely applicable and, and sort of common steps made in chemistry space, if you like, during the course of optimization. They're also supplemented by a, a database of transformations called Biostar, which has over 27,000 
transformations. Again, representing actual optimization steps made in the course of chemistry and published in literature. So when you generate a new compound using this approach, uh, obviously the models can give you a prediction for whether it's likely to be of interest. And if so, you can then actually go back and see, you know, how was that uh, transformation, how was the synthesis achieved in the past, what was the rationale published in that particular paper, um, and, and what was the result for that particular project. So it helps you to really sort of drill down and decide if that's a relevant strategy for your specific project. Okay, so maybe one more apologies for everyone who we haven't answered yet. Uh, we will follow up by email with any questions we don't uh, manage to answer in the, in the course of uh, today's session. But the last one is, um, how do you actually choose? What statistical method do you use to choose the, the best model generated? So, Ben, would you mind just taking that last one? Um, yeah. Um, the best model generated is in, oh, well, is in the Alchemite model. Oh. <laughs> yes. So, um, I guess when you're going through either a hyperparameter optimization or choosing different parameters, how would you say, that, well, this is the, the, the best model that we would choose to actually use in practice? Well, yeah, so you, you can measure across all of your assays something like the, the, uh, the either the R squared or the RMSE um, on a validation set. Uh, it's got to be held out validation. And then um, we would usually put it through this Bayesian optimization sort of process um, uh, uh, to, to, to optimize the, the parameters. Um, but essentially, we're looking for the model that performs uh, best um, on average uh, across all of the different endpoints that we're looking at. Is that right? Yes. Well, yes. If that. Okay. Well, well thank you all very much. Um, uh, it's been great to, to see so many of you on the line, so many still on the line, even though we're past the time. So let me just uh, wrap up with one final slide. Uh, to say thank you again, uh, particularly a, a big thank you to Professor Matt Todd for joining us today and telling us more about the Open Source Malaria Project. Um, we will be posting this uh, webinar, a full recording of the webinar, on our online community very shortly, and we'll, we'll send you a link to where you can find more information, uh, find the recording, and, and please feel free to share that with any of your colleagues who may be interested. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, uh, probably in the autumn.